Pastor Tom, and that we can support
Thank you, ladies. That was absolutely beautiful. Again, we often recognize it. Together, God has greatly blessed us in regard to our musicians. Uh, we praise God for them. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, once again, and I'm reflecting uh, tonight again on your faithfulness to us, Lord. We meet here every single Sunday evening, and every single Sunday evening, you meet with us. And every single Sunday evening, you bless us. And the, every single Sunday evening, you challenge us and encourage us, both through the testimonies of your people and the songs that we sing, and then especially in the inscripturated word of God. We rejoice in you again tonight, God. We revel in your grace and mercy. We revel in your kindness to us, your tender mercies that prompt you to stoop way, way down, not only to save us, but to minister to us in every possible way. What a great God. We exalt you again tonight. And we ask the Lord for your help as we seek to be good students of the word of God. We again acknowledge our dependency upon you and specifically the Holy Spirit of God and we love what he does, we often cite it. He first turns the light on, and then he empowers us to actually incorporate into our lives the truth that we have seen and understood. All praise to you, Jesus. Do that great work again tonight as we proceed, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our study in James continues in chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. James issues, you'll recall, a warning to the wicked rich. It's a warning of future divine judgment. We've been uh, having our noses to the grindstone here, and because we have, it may be easy for us to actually forget that this is a prophetic text, which is interesting, especially with a view to those of you that participated in the Friends of Israel Prophecy Conference here. The judgment that James has in mind really focuses in on two things. I guess I shouldn't say it like that. The judgment James has in mind, he certainly has it in mind, but he, he is uh, obviously the spokesman here on behalf of God. And the judgment that James speaks of here really focuses in on two things. We've noted this. One, how the wicked rich have come about their riches. We looked at that last week as we considered verse 4. And then, too, how the wicked rich subsequently used their riches, which we consider tonight with verses 5 and 6. I can assure you that we are not and will not see like a Robin Hood scenario where, and we um, empathize and sympathize with that kind of scenario where the, um, where the poor are robbing the rich and then giving back to the poor. Actually, here, James is describing just the opposite. It's the rich with their multiplied riches, their heaped together riches that are actually stealing from the poor so that in turn uh, the, the rich can become more rich. And so really we have the story not of Robin Hood here but of the Sheriff of Nottingham. Take a look, verses 5 and 6, I'm, I'm reading. Well, let me read the text with you, James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, and then we'll uh, pause and emphasize verses 5 and 6. So here we go. James 5 and verse 1, Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, you recall. Ye have lived in pleasure. Here's verses 5 and 6. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your heart as in the day of slaughter, Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. 
Boy, that phrase at the beginning of verse 5 is striking. I, I think it's a phrase, that, and, and we're not plucking out. We know that we need to be careful about that, but I think it's okay to temporarily remove a phrase so that uh, we see it as it is and, uh, and it really grips our hearts. That's a striking phrase. They lived in pleasure. You know I'm an epitaph guy. I'm partly an epitaph guy because, and I know this is your testimony as well, the, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ has been so rich and so full in my life by his grace and mercy that, that I really can't wait to see him. And uh, I, I certainly can testify along with you that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and his work in my life has been great enough to the extent that I have uh, no, no fear of death. And uh, we, we, we've sort of, you know, brushed shoulders with it uh, from time to time. And so, uh, you know, I'm not uh, speaking off the cuff in regard to that. I've, I've often talked to you about epitaphs, both uh, epitaphs that would be appropriate and ones that wouldn't. I often think about my own life, again, not pridefully, I, I assure you, uh, humbly, in, in regard to how uh, one's life may be summed, I summed up, I, I believe that there's value to that. I, I really do. I, there's a lot of epitaphs that I certainly am trusting God will help me to live a life and in, in such a way so that my life, you know, goes beyond that. I remember out west for the first time hearing the epitaph, uh, here lies Lester Moore, shot in the head with a 44, no less, no more. And I'm hoping that my family doesn't put that on my gravestone. And I'm glad that my name is in Lester Moore. And here's one that would be disheartening. He lived in pleasure. Isn't that something? It sounds so good, you know, like initially. And the worldling certainly would say, wow, <laughs> that's awesome, right? The worldling would say, that's awesome. He lived in pleasure. The heart of God's people absolutely sank. This is one of the last things that we'd want to have written on our tombstone. He lived in pleasure. James says, ye have lived in pleasure on the earth. Man, does that open up the proverbial can of worms. I, I mean in every way, including even our thinking broadly about life. What I mean by that is a reminder, why, why have you and I been given life? Is this it? Why have you and I been given life? Why are we here? What is the purpose of life? What is the goal of our earthly sojourn? Sometimes even God's people need to be reminded of the fundamental truth here. It can be stated and has been stated in a number of ways, including these succinct statements. We are, here, here's one, we are here to know God and to, can you complete it? Yes, sorry, I, I didn't set you up well because there's a zillion answers, but this, we are here to know God and to make him known. And you were right to, we are here to know God and to serve God. We are here to be saved and to be sanctified. Listen, we are here to be saved and to be sanctified so that we can see others saved and sanctified. You can hear the passing along of one's faith. We, we could even pull out some of the old uh, confessions going back and not that we would necessarily embrace every tenet of the confession, but we can even pull some of that out. We are, we, we are here to glorify God. That's about as succinct as you can state it. We are here to glorify God. We are here to serve God and others. Boy, I think you would agree with me that we would take any one of those as an epitaph. Can you, can you imagine? He glorified God. He served God and others. He was saved and sanctified, and through that, others were saved and sanctified. What a, what a neat thing. Here's the problem. 
living in pleasure isn't even on the list. So be very, very careful. Now, I say in the same breath, and I don't want you to, under, I don't want you to misunderstand. There is great joy. We sing about it, and it isn't always on our faces, but I know it's in our hearts. There is great joy in serving Jesus. There is joy in serving Jesus. In fact, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the times in your life when, they, when, when you were the most joyful and the most satisfied was those times when you were wholeheartedly loving and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no doubt about that. It is the greatest thing this earthly sojourn has to offer us. There is joy in knowing and loving and serving the Lord Jesus Christ, so don't misunderstand. And there are many legitimate pleasures that God affords his people. But spiritual maturity recognizes and embraces this. God is more concerned about our holiness than our happiness. I couldn't help but think of the words of Christ in Luke 2 and 15, you're not turning, where he reminds us that a man's life consists not of his possessions. And by the way, it goes on. It's neat to see that within context. In fact, I think we have the time. I'm going to take you over there. Take a look at 12, uh, Luke 12. One of the reasons why we're going is because of what uh, Christ follows up with after making this um, very significant statement. So, so Luke uh, chapter 12, uh, verse 15. And, and then we'll uh, scoot quickly through the parable of the rich fool, which is so appropriate in light of our study in James. So Luke 12 and verse 15. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Now watch and listen to the parable of the rich fool. And again, for uh, the appropriate Bibles, uh, red letter Additions we see an awful lot of red. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my goods? By the way, we, it's been a while, and we haven't, and I didn't say to you that I was reading without comment, so I'm safe in regard to that. And it's been a while, although you are very familiar with the parable, it's been a while since we've noted anything about it, and I would be hard-pressed to come up with a time that we actually um, exegetically studied our way through the parable, but wow. I don't know if you catch that. I'm sure that you do, but in verse 17, uh, we know right away that, that this guy's in trouble. You know, our, our perspective and our anticipation would be very much different if we see and hear him here crying out to God. But once again, we have a man thinking within himself. We have a man talking to himself rather than to God. Kind of like the story of the publican and the Pharisee. So verse 17, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, this will I do, I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? And verse 21 so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Again, we don't, we, we don't, we can't take it with us, you know, in regard to these physical possessions. We rejoice over the fact that we can use our physical possessions in such a way so that they count for all of eternity. But you'll not be taking your cars, you'll not be taking your houses, you'll not be taking your bank account, you'll not be taking your silver and your gold. It's interesting, by the way, and there's a little bit different tangent that, you know, I just uh, mentioned with you in case you want to pursue this further. 
Just work again through uh, the book of Proverbs and listen to how often Solomon is addressing the rich and how often Solomon is addressing the wealth of the rich. And, uh, and note all of the depictive ways in which Solomon approaches that. For instance, one that really struck me this past week is, is that our money and our gold and silver, they have wings. Right? They have wings. They fly. The way we say it is, I have a hole in my pocket. <laughs> and we mean even a little bit more than that, but boy, Solomon had it right. And sorry, I'm, I'm not rambling, but I am thinking off from the top of my head and heart with you. I, you, you know, as I continue to think through our text in James, I'm also often in my heart and mind going back to Ecclesiastes written by Solomon, and I remind you again that here was a man who not only had dreams like you and I of, oh boy, I would love to have this and that and the other, but he actually had the resources in order to obtain it. And here's a man who received everything and got, ev got for himself everything that his heart desired, his testimony, not mine. And, and the conclusion of that is vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Emptiness of emptiness. Solomon says. And he actually had a relationship with God. Oh, folks, it's amazing how close we can become like the worldling when we sever ourselves and our things practically from God. Back to James. Again, life's three most important questions, then. That's where I went to uh, following, if I can re-engage you um, life's three most important questions. Where did you come from? It's neat that God's in the process of helping us to rehearse these questions and the answers. Where did you come from? Why are you here? And where are you going? And to plug that back into our study in James, we could ask it like this. What's going to matter in the last days? What's going to count? I like this. What's going to count when we give an account? What's going to count? when we give an account to Christ. The phrase, ye have lived in pleasure, and I, I like identifying this with you, I'm not sure why, but it's uh, once again a single word in the original language. It means literally to indulge in luxury, and so we have a good translation here, obviously, but what we don't see is the root upon which the compound Hebrew word is formed, and this is very interesting. It speaks of one's mind, listen to this, it speaks of one's mind and body breaking down because of indulgence. And as I came to grips with that, and I'm sorry because I didn't lead you well up to it, but as I came to grips with that, I was reminded of the subtlety and the deception of our enemy. And I was reminded of the subtlety and the deception of this world in which you and I live. The world says this way to happiness and what it delivers is harm. And in fact, for the Christ rejecter, the world says this way to happiness and what it delivers is hellfire. It's not a pretty picture. And I, I suggest that we continue to listen to and embrace the words of the God of truth, <laughs> the God who can not lie. So really, James, when he talks about uh, these rich men who have lived in pleasure, he's, he, he's actually painting an interesting portrait for us. These are men who have followed hard after pleasure, and such course has led to pain. I um, remind you that when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, I guess I'm not even going to fill in the blank for you going to be interesting when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ as to what he is not concerned about. And it's going to be very interesting when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ in, the, in regard to what he is concerned about. James goes on to write, ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. I, uh, noted this with you in passing before. It sends us to Daniel 5, right? Absolutely uh, amazing. 
uh, the story of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. By the way, I know as he knows, and we know from Daniel 5, the narrative that talk about real literal history. <laughs> and talk about prophecy, by the way. We look back that at the time, you know, of Daniel's writing, uh, so much of what Daniel wrote was looking ahead sometimes to soon events, events that would soon unfold, and then some events that um, wouldn't unfold for, we, we know now, a millennia. And in fact, Daniel, of course, uh, speaks of many events that have not yet unfolded, which uh, means that we are, um, we, we are in uh, the, this thing. I, I, I have just lost you, haven't I? You remember Daniel 5, we're not turning king of Babylon. Babylon was a world empire, you know that. We're, it's a little bit foreign to us. We, we're a strong country, right? And we know, um, and even have testified again tonight, uh, Brother Dwayne, for instance, we're, we're, we are clearly losing our strength. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out why. But even at our greatest strength, we still waned in comparison to the various world empires that Daniel said would come and go. So you gotta keep that in mind when we think about the king of Babylon and although we know from the narrative that the empire is about to fall and go into the hands of another people group, uh, we're, we're probably talking about the, the, the most powerful man on the face of the planet. And probably the most prideful man on the face of the planet. Belshazzar. He has a drunken orgy. He has the audacity to use the vessels from the house of God. By the way, don't mess with the vessels of the house of God. Don't mess with the vessels of God. Guess what? You are among them. Don't mess with God's vessels. So God, in turn, writes Belshazzar a, a message on the palace wall. Hmm. Minai, Minai, Tikal, Yefarsin. Minai to number, number, number. Belshazzar, you and your kingdom are numbered, numbered. Tikal, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting and you farsen to divide your kingdom will be divided and given to as you know from a historicity standpoint the Medes and the Persians you've been weighed in the balance and found wanting that's what James says of the wicked rich here James goes on to say of the rich ye have this is Again, so depictive. You, you have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. I, I, I guess I get to tell you my cow story. Because this is like uh, fattening up a cow in order to slaughter it. And by the way, while, while I have you there, you, you see that cow, he is very, very happy to eat. He just eats and eats and eats. He doesn't know and he's about to be slaughtered. And that's the portrait again, the, James, the picture that James paints here of the wicked rich. We're coming to church tonight. We, we're coming to church tonight. This is so interesting. We're coming to church tonight, and we looked off about a mile and a half uh, east of town on 55, and I looked over to the right-hand side, and there was uh, a bunch of cows that were up against the fence, and there was one I was certain that had gotten through the fence and was actually eating grass near the ditch of the road. So I was pretty concerned. And so we did a little bit of texting and I kind of um, uh, buzzed over here. I didn't exceed the speed limit. Remember the magistrate has given me face to face permission to go five miles over the speed limit. <laughs> Even though I never take advantage of that, Josh. So, so we abided by the speed limit and got here e efficiently, and I dropped off Ann and Luke, and I said to Ann and Luke, I, I, I'm going to have to go back. I'm a little concerned about that. You can imagine this wasn't a full-grown cow, probably, you know, a, uh, a year-and-a-half-old kind of thing. 
and that reminds me of another cow story. You're, you're pretty fortunate that we're getting near the end of our time because uh, it would be unending cow stories. And uh, so I, I, I headed back there because I was concerned about that thing stepping out on the road and uh, someone hitting it. And um, I, I went back and, and, and I couldn't believe it. All, all the cows were absolutely gone. There wasn't a single cow anywhere to be found there. I, uh, this was kind of strange. That, that's, another, that's my one cow story. The other one I can tell you very quickly. I was heading up north one time when I was a young fella uh, hunting with my dad and grandpa. And uh, I was uh, going down the road. And that, this was when I was uh, young. And uh, you won't believe this, but I was actually pretty fit. And I, uh, I, I uh, was going down the road, and uh, the place where we hunt, they, um, they run cows in there, feed, feed cows on the property. And I was going down the, this side road, and I looked, and there was a calf on this side of the fence. So I said uh, to myself, um, and I was all alone, I, I said to myself, I'm going to stop, and I'm pretty sure that I can probably pick that thing up and just put it over top of the fence. I was so embarrassed. <laughs> I, I did get a hold of the cow, but that's you know really where the story ends. <laughs> James says the rich man is, with the, as, as he heaps up his riches for the last days, really like a a, a cow that's being fattened up in, in order to be slaughtered. It's a sad. Scenario. And then verse 6, I leave you with this. I'd, I'd like to save verse 6, and of necessity, we save verse 6 for next week, but I'll tell you, there, there is a gem and golden nugget here, even though the terminology is great. I want to save verse 6 for next week, the Lord willing, but I, I want to read it and make one broad comment, and then we'll let you go. So here we are, James 5 and verse 6. Ye, speaking again of the wicked rich, have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. You know, you guys are so good, and so you're, you, you've jumped um, ahead, and I am glad for that. But, but um, let me pursue that with you, uh, the Lord willing, next week. James employs a, a beautiful... Is that the right word? J James employs, yeah, I'm going to say beautiful play on words here, which means that some of the remarkable truth that we have here in verse 6 is almost hidden. Very much looking forward to looking at that with you next week, the Lord willing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the very practical teaching that we have in James. We knew that going in. And James has never strayed from that theme. That we would not just hear the word of God, but that we would actually practically do it, that it would practically unfold in our lives. And uh, we, we've noted many things as we've been hovering over this text uh, relating to um, this divine warning uh, for, for the wicked rich. And, and yet at every turn you've been reminding us of principles that are very much applicable to us. I just pray, Lord, that we would heed and embrace each and every one. And, and God, uh, thinking about our lives, really this uh, simple reminder of even why we are here is valuable to us. And, and I certainly pray that we would continue to be a people that are um, living out their lives with eternity's values in view, as we stated earlier in your message, that we would that we'd make sure that our lives are revolving around things that count when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ to give an account. So impress these things upon our hearts. Tonight we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, please, now, and turning over to 458 in our hymnal. 458. Just gonna, we're gonna, they're, they're short verses. We're gonna sing three and four, please. 458, standing together. Verse three and four. 
Take my lips and let them be filled with messages for thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my love, my God, I pour, that thy feet its treasure store. Take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for thee. I'll remind you of the vision team to follow. Um, Brother Raven. Father, thank you for this day that we have been in your house and heard your word. Thank you for the message tonight about the things that you are concerned about and the things that you are not concerned about. Thank you that uh, we have this opportunity now to apply that to our lives. Help us to be not just hearers of the word, but doers also. Help us to live our lives out thinking about what's pleasing to you. Guide us now this evening in Jesus' name.